Okay. Hi, Joy. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, it is so great to be here with you. So tell me all about, I want, I feel like I want to know about you. Oh, you're tell sweet. Me, where are you at? What's going on? How's the baby? She's good. She doesn't know anything's going on. So, so that's great. Um, I'm in Utah right now with my parents, but I'm actually about to head back to New York and, and brave it there. So we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm kind of anxious to get back to my own space and I have a special ballet floor waiting there for me in my apartment. So Oh, nice. Yeah, the company sent out um, little, because we, you know, we dance on a special surface for our point shoes, like, uh -huh. so that you don't slip. So I'm, I haven't really been doing point work and I'm excited to get back for that. So. Oh, that's so great. So you live in Manhattan? I live in Union City, New Jersey, actually. So I'm just outside of Manhattan with a beautiful view. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm so happy for you. And I'm, I'm like giggling to myself because, um, so I, you get sent a ballet floor, and I get sent special lighting for the kitchen. Like that's what NBC <laughs> sent to me. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, let me let me uh, formally introduce you. This is Joy Bauer, who is you're our nutritionist at New York City Ballet, right? But you're right. also like this renowned health like recipes guru at the Today Show. You have tons of recipe books. My family in particular are very big fans. My mom is a dietitian. She used to work in a hospital for 35 years and she really appreciates your recipes. So they do your enchiladas. We did your, your black bean brownies. We do your turkey meatballs. We just did two nights ago. So the new book. So I just dropped um, my superfood book. So tell your mom okay. who is my fellow health nut that I have 150 new recipes coming her way. Oh, amazing. She, they really are like huge fans. When I told them, oh, I'll email Joy that we made her enchiladas, they were like, wow, you have her email. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you should tell your mom, I remember the first time you and I met and we, we had a chance to really sat down, we, we sat down one-on-one -on -one and really rapped about everything. And as soon as you told me that your mom was a dietitian, I had this instant connection to you. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, so you tell her, I feel like I know her. Awesome. I will. I will. I'm sure she'll watch this. So um, I wanted to talk to you because I think even for the rest of the world that's not a dancer, this could be a weird moment for eating habits. And as dancers, we have such like, you know, this intense pressure to stay a certain shape, whatever that is. Maybe it's bigger than you want to be, maybe it's smaller than you normally want to be, like, you know, you got to fit in that costume, you got to look the part, and it's mostly about maintaining, and I, I've found myself part of, the majority of that is, it's, it's in a mental game, and I was wondering how you recommend, how you're recommending for people to deal right now with this quarantining experience, where your fridge is always right there, you have too much time on your hands, like, how do you approach the mental game of eating for yourself, and, and how do you suggest to other people to get through, you know, that, uh, that kind of struggle when food's on the mind too much? Right, right. And I, I think it's actually a really good time to talk about this because in the beginning when it first happened, everybody sort of felt like it was this prolonged snow day. You know, we were in our pajamas and we were eating anything and everything and we were going for the comfort foods. If you didn't have it in the house, we were figuring out ways to make them or to get them. And, um, you know, even though I am this, you know, extreme health nut and foodie, um, I fell victim to that stuff too. And my home office was in the kitchen. So it was like right there. And again, like I was in stretchy pants and it was before we were figuring out how to go live on TV from my kitchen. Now I think everybody has sort of been there, done that. And um, they're, they're starting to get a little bit nervous about, you know, coming undone and unraveling or putting on weight and not feeling great when we come out of this. And hopefully that's going to be soon. So now you're catching me when people want to turn this around and it's no longer a snow day and we're kind of on the other side and hopefully we're going to be coming out of it soon. And it's really a head game. I think that if, forgive all these beeps and no worries. we're gonna get, yeah, I forgot to shut that stuff off. <laughs> It'll be background music. <laughs> Um, I think that the, the number one thing is to get your head in the game, right? Um, eating well and staying on a healthy routine is 50% attitude. It's not rocket science. So if you believe in yourself, you give yourself some sort of a roadmap, it's very likely that you're going to follow through. So I think 
right now, whoever's listening, if you're struggling, or even if you're not struggling, I think one of your homework assignments will be to formalize this, to whip open your computer or take a pad and, and, and paper, write down what your goal is and start to pre-plan. What am I gonna have for breakfast? What am I gonna have for lunch? What am I gonna have for dinner? What am I not going to have for snacks and in between? Because when you write it down on paper, or on the computer, it becomes more official. And the other thing is that when you set boundaries for yourself, and I'm talking to the right crowd because you are type A goal-oriented people, males and females, right? Like we wanna get stuff done. Right. And, and, and we have very definitive um, goals and uh, finish lines that we want to hit. So write it down make you a plan for yourself and chances are you're going to follow through. And when it comes to food, I found that when you pre-plan for what you're going to eat, so instead of just waking up in the morning and deciding that, you know, you're going to have leftover Chinese food or like frozen pizza, if you know, if you knew from the night before that you were going to wake up and you were going to make an omelet with loads of vegetables and maybe some grapefruit on the side, you're going to wake up and crave it. And the same thing is going to happen if you know that you're going to have a big voluminous gorgeous salad for lunch with beans and some grilled chicken or whatever it may be. When lunch rolls around, your mouth is watering thinking about that particular salad. So I think the roadmap is so darn important. Because you are who you are, you're, you're an elite athlete, you know how to do this. So it's, it's a mental thing right now. So, you know, um, get your head in the game, make it formal, and the good stuff will follow. So planning seems to be key. So does that come down to going to the grocery store? And, and would you suggest planning meals for the week and then buying stuff to support that? And how much do we let ourselves have the treats and buy the fun things? Um, so, so first off, I think that um, when you sit down and you figure out what you're going to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next week, and I like doing this in a week format for sure, and really we're creatures of habit, so we end up repeating the same three things on rotation a lot, a lot of the time anyway. So if you make your list, then do a review of what you already have in the pantry, in the refrigerator, in the freezer. And if anybody needs recipe inspiration, like go to my Instagram, you know, noodle around on my website. There's so many free, healthy, calorie controlled recipes there that you could feel really good about eating. And there's no, not a lot of fancy ingredients. And then make your list of what are the things that you need to buy at the grocery store versus the things that you already have in your house. And if it's not safe to go out, you can find what to make with what's on hand. There's always stuff that you can make. And then in terms of the treats, you know I'm a treat girl. My whole mantra is 90-10, 90% healthy, 10% fun. So as long as you build in that wiggle room, and I would say one treat a day, but you want to make it a small portion, and if you know it winds up being a larger portion, then skip it the next day. Right. It's a balancing act. Right. It's a balancing act. It's not you know nothing is off limits because I think what happens is when you make something off limits or you feel deprived, um, and you're not satisfying what you know you're craving, it's going to backfire with a vengeance. I always say to my ballerinas, for every restriction. There is a binge waiting for you you're, right around the corner. You're absolutely right. I went through a binging f period in my life where I was trying so hard to be a certain way and restricting. And then you go and you work all day long in the theater and you are really hungry. And it's those two things combined. When you finally see food, you're like, you're taking in way more than you actually need. It's like an eating anxiety attack. Exactly. Right? Exactly. You know, you're, hard, you're, you're hungry. You're physically hungry. And, you know, your body is the house that you live in 24 7 every day for the rest of your life. You have to respect it. Right. And, like, take care of it. And, and I, for me, taking care of it means treating it and making sure that it doesn't ever get to that deprived feeling because that is so dangerous. And, 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 exactly. and then it's a cycle. 
That's right. And when you build in those treats and then you're able to like shake it off and forge forward, like that's when the magic happens. Right. Eating in the middle, having a peaceful relationship with food and you found it. Right. I, I have. It, you know, for me, um, it's been about setting down a placemat and setting a nice every time I eat, really making it an experience instead of just kind of eating on the go or eating snack, 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 you know, and making it, this is my breakfast, this is my lunch. That's really helped me um, in these last couple years. It's, it's, it's kind of neat to hear you say it like that because you're so artistic. So it makes sense that you would make the presentation and the experience of the meals um, an artistic happening as well, so to speak, right? But I think one of the best pieces of advice for anyone who is having either issues now or has always had issues with food is to never let yourself eat standing up. Mm. Always plate it, sit down, and own it. Right. No matter what it is, even if it's, you know, Oreos. I like or the owning it. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a couple, like, things of which do you prefer. So, um... Like, I remember when we met, we, I told you I had used spray butter, but I can't believe it's not spray butter. And you told me you sent it into a lab and found out it says it's zero calories for the serving size, but the whole little bottle is actually 900 calories or something <laughs> insane. So made me wonder, do you, uh, and for a long time when I was in this really, you know, trying so hard to control what I was eating in my life, I really hung on to calories and counting. And I've kind of discarded that. And I'm wondering which you think is better for the mental game. Like, is that an obsessive thing that actually is not helpful to count your calories? Or what's the best way to check in and know that portion's big enough for me? Um, so it's a tough question for me to answer because I think it's dependent on your personality. So some people don't get super caught up and um, obsessive with the numbers. And then it's a really great gauge. They like to track their food because it keeps them in check. Um, it also helps to calm them if they think that they've gone overboard when in fact you, when you look at it on paper it's not so bad like everything is recoverable right so um, for some people it really works it's like weighing for some people hopping on the scale even every day is like a nice reality check it's a little bit of their comfort blanket and then they move forward and they have a perfectly fine day for other people that scale is like a crazy horrific experience and then I say like pack it up or throw it out and right. just go by your jeans so calories are the same thing you have to know yourself you have to know what works for you and what doesn't work for you and for some people just eating well and um, you know feeling balanced is enough and by the way when you eat well your calories fall into place anyway right. but for some people they just like numbers right they need a little bit more information they right. like to dissect and analyze and that's okay too so right. you, ha you have to just figure out how, how does it make you feel it's like gluten how does it make you feel if it makes you feel bleh and bloated you get rid of it if it works for you and it empowers you you keep it within and you that can always change that stuff too right and I've evolved myself. Um, and I, I was, that was my next question, scale or no scale. I'm definitely a scale person. It calms me down. Doing a, having a career where I stare in a mirror all day long, it makes me shut off the, the, the eyeballs looking at myself too much. So, so I definitely agree with you. And it works for you. And what's nice about that is it gives you a reality check. It doesn't let your imagination get the best of you. If you didn't know the number, maybe what would happen is you would look in the mirror and start to see like a bump and right. a lump. Or, you know, so it's, so for you, it definitely works. Now I've worked with other ballerinas who get so fixated on that scale and they'll jump on and off several times a day and then I say yeah get it, it out of the apartment or your home right it's good for you okay that's great my next uh which do you prefer question is like low fat or full fat because sometimes you know giving yourself a something that's you know the normal full fat of something might it fill you up a little bit more what, what are your thoughts on that Okay, so now specifically speaking to my ballerinas, my ballet dancers, 
Um, I would say that I would go for the reduced fat when you can, but we're only, t we're really, what we're talking about now is probably dairy. Yeah. So I'm only talking about dairy. We're talking about milk and we're talking about yogurt. And the reason I would say you go for the reduced fat when you can within your home or when you have a choice, when you're in a deli or a grocery shop or possibly a restaurant, like for example, when you're putting milk in your coffee is because when you look at the varying types of yogurts and milks, whether it's full fat, low fat, or no fat, you're getting the same big dose of protein. You're getting the same amount of calcium, no matter what it is. Right. I'm comparing brand to brand to brand. You're getting the same calcium and you're getting the same vitamin D. So that being said, the only thing that's really changing are the calories and also the saturated fat. Saturated fat is pro-inflammatory. So we could all use less saturated fat. And in terms of the calories, I feel like most dancers, not the guys, the guys a lot of the times are like trying to keep pounds on. And in that case, I might say go for the full fat. But speaking with the girls, I would say, you know, a, a lot of the times you're trying to slightly defy genetics and you want to be able to eat the most amount of calories and high quality food that you can. So if you skim on, if you go for low fat or non-fat dairy, you end up having more calorie wiggle room for other stuff that you love. The other, the other point here is that when you have your treats, I mean, we're not getting low fat chocolate. And when we get a slice of pizza out and about, it's going to be the real cheese. Right. So then I say, you go for the real McCoy, but when you're in the house, you can buy like the shredded reduced fat cheese. You can buy the low fat milk and the low fat yogurt. And then real ice cream out and about, real pizza out and about. Um, so that's how I would work it. Right. That's great. I love that. Um, I got to cut off my, my beeper. Hold on a minute. I'm so no sorry. worries. Okay. Um, my next question is, High protein, low carb is kind of always been a popular diet throughout time, and it's called different things over time. It was Atkins, it was the paleo, you know, and now we're kind of heading into to this time where there might be like a meat shortage. So if that was kind of the, you know, and I think protein for me, it not only gives me energy to dance, but it, it helps like make the meal last longer. I don't know if that's scientific, but um, what are we... Is, is high protein, low carb a good thing for a dancer? And then what do you do when there's no protein? <laughs> okay, so big question. So first off, um, you it, what you said makes a lot of sense. Protein um, helps to stabilize your blood sugar levels and it keeps you feeling fuller for longer. So having protein with all of your meals and your snacks when you can is a really, really great thing. Um, when you have plant-based protein, so now we're talking about things like beans and lentils um, and legumes and nuts and seeds and nut butters, those things also, unlike meat and beef, those things come packaged with fiber, which is like the ultimate winning formula for steady blood sugars. And when you have steady blood sugars, you have more energy, sustainable energy, and it keeps you feeling full for longer. So in jumping, I'm going to go back to the first part of the question, but jumping to the second question, the things that you want to befriend right now, and we are, it looks like we are going to be having a shortage with um, beef and with chicken. First off, fish is great. Fish is fabulous. It could be fresh fish. It could be frozen fish. It could be canned fish. Um, I love wild Alaskan salmon that also has the heart healthy omega-3 fats. And they're specifically great for you, Megan, because they also tame inflammation. So all of the soreness and the typical aches and pains that you have from all the dancing and the working out, omega-3s are like your best friend. So wild salmon and sardines and light canned tuna. You don't want to do the white albacore tuna because that's too high in mercury. They're larger fish. They accumulate mercury. But the light canned tuna, which is very reasonable, it's budget friendly, that's, that's um, a, a, a good fix for you guys. And then um, aside from that, the canned beans and lentils, and then yogurts are great. Eggs are great. What I like to do with eggs is I would mix one whole egg with three egg whites. The whites are pure protein. Um, the yellows give you a little bit of iron. They give you from some vitamin D, and they also give you um, lusciousness, right? You know, like right. the eggs, the yellows always make you feel more substantial. But that's where most also of the calories are housed. 
and the saturated fat, which again is inflammatory. So if you have one whole egg and then a whole lot of egg whites, as many as you want, you can make this like ginormous omelet with all sorts of vegetables inside. And that's a great thing that you can have also, you know, if, if and when we're dealing with this shortage right now. Right. And yogurt. Did I mention yogurt? Greek yogurt is awesome. It has twice the amount of protein as traditional yogurt. Um, you could add some nice fresh fruit on top and you could have a parfait, maybe with some granola or nuts or seeds. Nuts and seeds are another great protein option. Or you can also put a dollop of it instead of sour cream on a baked potato and then it becomes a meal. Right. So there's so many things that you can do with yogurt. I love Greek yogurt. That's great. I'm, it also made me think, what are your thoughts on like vegetarianism and, and be, becoming vegan like at, for a dancer? I think, don't you think it causes a lot of challenges? You know, you can eat, be a really strong person as a vegetarian. There's this new documentary out now. I don't know if it's on Netflix or what it is, but it's about being a vegetarian. They're like these bodybuilders, you know? So I know it's possible, but like you have to really make sure you're getting those beans in and like you can't just be a vegetarian that's eating bread. Like what are your thoughts on that when you see people gravitating towards these trends? So you can absolutely be a responsible vegan. So so let's go the extreme. So okay. a vegetarian would be somebody that would still incorporate sometimes eggs and dairy. But if you're going to be a vegan, that's off the table too. It's absolutely possible, but I would strongly recommend that you sit down with a registered dietitian and you work out exactly what you need in terms of B vitamins and um, iron and protein because it's going to be more difficult. You can't be eating like the vegan bagel, French fry, and right. like cracker diet. Yeah, right. But the vegan also like not going to work for you. And as a dancer, you need extra protein. You need about 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. Normal people like me, we need about 50%, like 0.5 uh -huh. per pound. You guys are in like you know, the elite athlete category. So you, you really make, need to make sure that you're getting ample amounts and you also need to make sure you're getting iron and right. vitamin D and all these other things. So there's gonna be supplements involved for sure. So the answer is yes, you can absolutely be a responsible, thriving vegan, but you're gonna need a multivitamin, you're probably going to also need like a vitamin D, possibly calcium, um, and you're going to need to sit down with somebody and make sure that you check out everything. B12 is another really important nutrient that you probably are going to have to take in a supplement form. Interesting. So vegetarianism, that's less difficult and, and you're not having to supplement as much with that because you can eat dairy. Right. There's, so there's different categories. So, and there's also like a pescatarian. Right. So a pescatarian would be you eat everything but just not beef and chicken. Right. And then there's a vegetarian, and that's when you don't eat beef, chicken, fish, dairy, or – wait, vegetarian. You do eat dairy yeah. and you do eat that. I'm confusing myself. <laughs> and then there's a vegan, and like all animal products are off the table, including honey. <laughs> What is the benefit to those raw diets where people are like, you know, is it, is there something to when you cook a vegetable that something is like leaving it? No, that's not no. a thing. The, they, the, the, um, the rawists, um, sort of feel their philosophy is, is that as soon as you heat anything, it destroys, you know, all of the goodness that's within that particular food. There's some other rules that go along with it as well. But here's what we know for fact. Um, when you cook certain things, you will slightly minimize some of the heat sensitive vitamins and minerals. Like for example, vitamin C is heat sensitive. And that's why you don't want to take, you know, vitamin C rich broccoli and boil it in a huge big thing of water and then drain all the water and just eat the broccoli. You, it's, it's packed, you'll still have some vitamin C, but you won't be getting all of it. On the other hand, if you're boiling broccoli in a broth that becomes your soup and you're slurping it all up, you're still ingesting it, so it's totally fine. Okay. When you roast your broccoli in the oven because you're not adding water, a lot, if not most, of the vitamin C maintains. And the same thing goes for the microwave. On the other hand, and this is where things get kind of cool, this is the science nerd in me coming out. 
Other things like the carotenoids, you've heard of beta carotene, which is fabulous for your skin, they become more bioavailable when things are heated. What happens is some, some of these things, another thing is called lycopene, which is an antioxidant in tomatoes. They're tightly, tightly wound in the matrix, the cell matrix of the membranes within those produce picks. And when we heat them, those membranes loosen up so our bodies can better absorb and soak in all the goodness. So some things get minimized, some things get elevated. The bottom line is eat raw, eat steamed, eat roasted, right. eat cooked, just get that produce in. Right, right. And then uh, you reminded me of supplements. And right now I think everybody's just trying to like stay as healthy as possible and keep their immune systems high. If, you know, say we're eating a balanced diet, would you add in any specific um, vitamins or minerals right now just to like amp up the immune system? Um, so I'm very much of a eat your nutrients kind of girl, um, but my answer is definitely yes for the supplements right now. Um, I have my entire extended family taking a multivitamin, a multivitamin mineral, just for backup, knowing that we're getting everything that we need to be getting. They're taking 500 milligrams of extra vitamin C. And because vitamin C um, helps to strengthen the immune system, it doesn't prevent you from necessarily catching things that are around, but I think it's really good assurance because if, if you already have a great immune system, it will help to maintain, okay. um, but if not, it's going to help to build it up. So I think like that's a really good idea, not long term, but right now. Um, the other interesting thing is that if you do get a bug, if you take vitamin C, no more than 500 milligrams, even like 250 would be okay, it helps to minimize some of the side symptoms, specifically respiratory. So it can help with the sniffles, it can help with coughing, stuffed up congestion, um, so that's sort of neat. And the other, the two other things would be if you feel anything coming on um, and if you end up catching or you have COVID, zinc would be a good idea to take. Zinc can help also to uh, shorten the duration of an illness when you have it. So it's not helpful beforehand, only when you start okay. feeling symptoms. Yes. Okay. Um, zinc, zinc, um, is definitely also a key player with building up the immune system, but supplemental doses are specifically important when you feel something coming on. Um, whereas vitamin C, I would say, just like do it as backup right now. And then the last thing is vitamin D, is in David, because nobody's outside. We're not get our body, our skins make vitamin D from the sun, and vitamin D is in David is also directly involved with strengthening the immune system. And it's one of those vitamins that it's really hard to get from food. The richest source is salmon. Salmon is a superstar in, in a lot of different directions, but specifically protein, the omega-3s, and vitamin D. And vitamin D is also fortified in not only regular cow's milk, but all the milk alternatives, almond milk and oat milk and cashew milk, because they're mimicking what's in cow's milk but you you don't really get that much from it so and i'm as a dancer vitamin d also enables calcium to keep your bones strong right how much so this, how much vitamin d um i think that if you were to take it right now because we're not getting outside a thousand i use a day is a good amount and that's overkill I wouldn't go higher than that unless you speak with your physician. And that doesn't mean you should be taking it. When this thing ends, you don't need to continue right. taking it. Right. Unless you've gotten a bone scan and you are at risk. You either have osteopenia or osteoporosis. But, like, man, bones, strong bones are your commodity. Yeah, they really are. You gotta make sure you get enough calcium. You get enough vitamin K from all of your green leafy vegetables. And you get that vitamin D in. Um, the last thing I want to ask, maybe I already said that, but this is really the last question. Um, I, oh, I love chatting with you. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. I have noticed staying at home, I'm finding it really hard to get my water intake in. Usually, like, you know, I pack my water bottle for activities and I take it with me and I drink it and on the way or whatever. And I'm finding, you know, when it's always there and the faucet and the, and the glasses are always there, I'm like keep into my coffee, and then I and then before I know it, it's like wine o'clock. So, 
how do you how do you keep up your water intake or like tell your kids like do you count glasses at home like how do you do it when you stay at home so this is what you're gonna do Um, being that you guys are not full-on dancing and performing right now I'm gonna give you an equation that's for the normal Joe but it'll be a great regimen for you you take your weight and you slice it in half and that is the least amount of ounces in water that you need every single day. Now keep in mind, so I hope everybody has that number. Take your weight, 50% of it, divide it in half, and that's how many ounces of water you need. So now have that number in your head, what your total ounces of water should be for the day. If you divide that by eight, eight ounces is a cup. So that's how many cups you need. And what I would do is, you know, maybe get one of those big reusable water bottles, see how many ounces or how many cups that it holds, and then you will know how many times you need to refill it and suck down that water during the day. Okay. And again, you, you're goal-oriented. You're going to nail this. But I, like, here's my second coffee. I am not drinking enough water. I definitely know that. So what about you are a spokesperson for La Croix and I love this brand of sparkling water. You're saying it's way more fancy than it is. It's La Croix. Oh, is it La Croix? So many people say La Croix. Yeah. It it has like a French feel when you say it like that. I like it. (laughs) So this is a good question. Does it count as some of those ounces of water? You're going to love this. So Bubble, flat water counts, bubbled water counts. Bubbles don't do anything to you. Only if you have tendency for gas, you know, then you, it might upset your stomach. And by the way, I wouldn't suggest drinking the carbonated water prior to performances. Just right. because, you know, you don't want to poof in your leotard and you also don't want to get little gas pockets. Just in case. Um, the LaCroix is amazing. So um, the flat water, sparkling water, and now you're really going to love me. You might have to kiss the screen. Coffee and tea count too. Yes. Yeah. So I have been drinking my water. You have. You know, I've been trying to. A lot of people that think that coffee, coffee is really important ha- right now. People think that coffee is so dehydrating, but what happens is it's it's only it's a very very um the, there's only a very small uh, dehydrating effect, and the more you drink coffee the more you become immune to the dehydrating effects. And a lot of people think like, oh my God, but I had two coffees and like I'm peeing like crazy. It's because it was a lot of liquid. And truth be told, if you had drank that much water, you probably would have been going to the bathroom at that rate as well. But coffee's fine. That's awesome. Do you think it it doesn't affect muscles? Like I've always thought, oh, I don't want to dehydrate myself with too much coffee and like have a calf spasm during the season. Like you don't think there's a correlation there? No, and, and that's one of these things, again, like trial and error. I would never want you to try anything for the first time during an important performance or an important rehearsal. So, you know, it's like it's like your magic meals, right? Like, you know what you eat prior to performing, and you probably know what you eat as a reward to celebrate when you've done an amazing job. It's the same thing with coffee, all of this experimentation. But interestingly enough, um, coffee, drinking one cup of coffee within an hour – of working out or practicing or dancing, as long as you're not caffeine sensitive and you don't get jittery, enables your muscles to contract longer and stronger. So it can actually enhance your workout. But again, huge caveat, as long as you are not caffeine sensitive. Okay, that's cool. You know, when I was on Broadway, the singers in my show were saying that they use it for their vocal cords. It helps wake their vocal cords up and I don't Makes know. Sense. So weird. I I did not know that. I love we, that. Like just a little jo- like oh, when I was on Broadway, <laughs> you're amazing. No, you are amazing. We are so grateful for your time. I'm gonna post this on my YouTube channel, and I just want all of the students and professionals out there to have access to your amazing information, specific to dancers. You're just so amazing. Thank you so much, Joy. Uh- well, if you end up getting a lot of questions and, um, you know, you want me to come back and then we could, you know, oh, call those great. questions, I would love to. But i got to see a little baby next time. I know. I'll, she'll make a cameo. Okay. You <laughs> promise? I promise. Okay. <laughs> Mwah. Bye, Joy. Take Thank care you. and stay Bye-bye. safe. You too. Big virtual hug. Yes. <laughs>